All right, Diana Hu, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me here, Craig. So maybe we should start from now and then go backwards in time. So you're working on AR at Niantic after your company, Escher Reality, has been acquired. How did you serendipitously stumble into AR? Into AR? Well, AR is a funny field. It's not like a single discipline. AR is a culmination of so many fields. Um, to really build a great experience for augmented reality, you need, of course, part the computer vision aspect to be able to take sensor image data to understand the world, graphics to render it. Then there's actually a lot of engineering to make all this run in real time. So systems, distributed systems, to make the experience just gel together. Plus, uh, to get it working at some point in devices, you have like hardware, optics, and there's so many of those pieces into it. And personally, I've come from a very diverse technical background. Mm -hmm. um, I've done before, I worked a lot in uh, cloud television before in recommender systems and doing analysis uh, on t television streams with computer vision techniques. So that was one space. I was in the space of um, semiconductors at Intel, so I understood a, bit, a few things about hardware. And coming into AR was an interesting point because it's, it's such a um, kind of, the, I really do think it's the next technology evolution. So we went from desktop, mobile, and next one in terms of representing information in a very rich way. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the space of um, mixed reality with AR, VR, and beyond. Mm -hmm. And that will take many, many disciplines to join in to do something interesting. And the reason coming into AR was that part. Plus, um, just I think always been interested in, in some sense of um, the possibilities of uh, what AR could do. So a lot of curious, uh, very, very curious about that, what it could take us to be able to see information, uh, blend in, 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 in the real, it's this, this concept of like pixels, photons, where's, where's the line mm. to narrow between pixels and photons? And do you recall the, the kind of like first exposure you had to it where it, it clicked? Where it clicked? Yeah. First exposure. So I think part of it is, um, the thing that I really enjoyed about AR is about being engaged in reality instead of uh, escaping it. Where imagination to show or tell a story is really used to engage even more so, mm -hmm. more deeply, with more layers of information represented, rather than really escaping it. Where the magic in, in AR, it's not, it's not just whimsical. The reason why magic is so magical is that in AR is that you see a lot of the digital representation believable there. And the first time I, couple projects that I done, I, I, there's some in the past, mm -hmm. I did uh, help some startups build some some projects way, way back. Uh, one of them was building a 3D light fill display. So basically you could see 3D without glasses. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, that's really cool. It's like holograms in, 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 in Star Wars. So that, that was one part. And then you start peeling the onion of what are all the pieces needed from the technology and, and AR is a fundamental piece to build this new kind of uh, infrastructure to just change the way we do computation for information. Mm -hmm. And so obviously like Niantic, you're working on games. Mm -hmm. um, at what point do you think AR becomes this kind of like first class citizen in media, you know, alongside video, photo? I guess audio. Yeah, I think it will um, it will take time because we're at the, at the early stages. I think the progress of um, technology has like different cycles. I mean, if you read some of the work by um, like Carlota Paris, who was that econo economist talking about innovation cycles, there's like big two stages. Stage okay. number one is when technology gets installed, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. uh, so installation types of technologies are when the applications are not ready to be built because you really need the tooling to be able to express those applications and examples of types of installation types of technologies are just like 
network infrastructure, operating systems, uh, programming languages, all these levels of abstractions that are needed because you're not going to, let's say an example, today it would be crazy to program a website based on assembly, right? Mm -hmm. So you really need those abstractions to be built to be able to have a richer way of creating experiences that are more advanced mm -hmm. because you, you want to kind of build on top of the abstractions always. So AR is kind of in that phase of really building the the installation phase <clears throat> of solving all the hard problems so that you get to a very expressive world in the future that I imagine where AR programming in AR could be just as simple as uh, spinning up a website. Because mm -hmm. right now it does require a lot of uh, very specialized um, understanding to create AR experiences because there's there's things with um, 3D, 3D environment development that are very good mix for game. This is why game is also very good for AR mm -hmm. in the early stages. That's kind of the part one. And just to give you, just to close this, uh, the second stage for, for this uh, technology cycle is the deployment phase. That is when really you see the explosion because you have this kind of solid infrastructure built. Mm -hmm. And deployment is when you have all these applications built into different industries. And at that point, let's say, just to give you another example, like the installation phase for mobile, just getting the, the hardware devices and the operating system with iOS and Android. And then the deployment was all this proliferation of apps. And it just explodes when the tooling and level abstractions is right enough. Mm -hmm. So for AR, just to close that, we're yeah. not there yet at all. There's a lot of groundwork that needs to be done. There's some early showcases because you do need examples of applications to be able to inform and build the right kind of OS infrastructure to accelerate that. And in particular for Niantic, it's an exciting place to be because we do uh, build a lot of real world games that, that are in the bread of a butter and f functions that very good information internally in the company to really take that knowledge to really build this, uh, this platform that we call it the real world platform, the Niantic real world platform. Yeah. And, and going further than that, as you talk about, you know, expanding past games into other, you know, markets. What are what are the signals you're looking for that you're even building the right thing? You know, you're like think about it in the context of like product market fit, right? Like, how do you even know you're going in the right direction? Because you can make analogies to the you know the software stack in in the web, but like it could be the wrong direction, right? Yeah, it could totally be the wrong direction, right? I mean, it's just kind of making educators get sometimes. Yeah. And the thing about AR is actually is not a completely new concept. The concept of augmented reality actually has been since came out way, way back, even in the 70s or with the first, actually the first uh, VR headset might've been even the six, I don't recall the exact date, yeah. but it was by this kind of monster thing called the Sword of Damaklas. It was like this really? giant thing, yeah. Okay. It's like early in days where people were just exploring things to how, what would it mean to display things directly to people's retinas? But of course, the computation power wasn't there, the optics weren't there, there's a lot of challenges not quite there yet. Uh, but things with uh, AR, more concretely, got a uh, head start in the 90s with uh, flight simulators. Mm -hmm. That's like super high-end stuff that is only available to um, like the government, right? Yeah. And it takes a couple cycles to really get the technology at a price point ready for consumers. Mm -hmm. Still kind of in the process of it. So I think the timing and knowing AR has been, it's not necessarily new, 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 but it is kind of the timing is getting there. There's a couple of things that are exciting why we decided to tackle AR. And the, one of the things actually about starting companies, you can have a great idea, you can have a great team and also great investors, but sometimes the timing is just something yeah. you don't control. And you could have all those other things be amazing, but the timing is so hard. And that's what gives you sometimes that multiplier effect. And the fact of it is just so many things, coming back to the first question, things outside your control and in the environment. So for AR, it came to be to couple trends in technology that really made sense. So a couple of them, one, it is uh, AR is tagging a lot along a lot of the inf infrastructure that uh, the mobile, mobile world built. Like it is very easy now to build um, like a phone, if you want it. There's like the supply chain for all the components, sensors and cameras and even processors, SOCs, super cheap. 
and that is easy and, and that is getting reused in fact for a lot of the hmm. now versions of AR headsets to hit the consumer price point mm -hmm. so riding that wave was like building on top of that infrastructure built by mobile like repurposing and swapping some things and still the optics needs to be figured out but a lot of those can be reused from the mobile space so second technology trend that really hitting for AR to be something real. Um, this is more law, Moore's Law, everyone is familiar with it, with computing getting faster every 18 months, twice, kind of, kind of, sometimes. Like, kind of, sometimes. I mean, yeah. now it's more about uh, many cores. Uh, so you could do more complex uh, computation for algorithms in oh. tiny devices, right? Mm -hmm. The other thing is, um, I don't hear many people talk about, but there's many versions of Moore's Law but for other other things like Kumi's law, okay, it's very similar. Every eighteen months, uh, with the exact same computation, is gonna be uh, half the power efficiency. So what that means, which is if you really look at the numbers, the which uh, last time I looked at it, the iPhone seven beats an all benchmark for CPU and power and sorry for CPU loads or GPU loads when you compute something. Mm -hmm as much as any MacBook Air that has been launched at a fraction of the power. Isn't that crazy, right? That's insane. Okay. So it tells you how powerful mobile devices and computation has gotten at the exact same. It's like you think of a MacBook Air, it's like pretty beefy, chunky computer that yeah, can do yeah, a lot of things. Pretty powerful. Yeah. And your iPhone 7 beats it uh, at a fraction of the power. Yeah. And you could apply that to, if you really track it, it's really getting to that that point where you're having compute that's becoming a lot more power efficient. And to get to headsets in AR, it would at some point hit that magical um, total power costs, mm -hmm. which they want to be in the single digit watt range. Okay. So you feel so you feel certain constraints on the actual hardware side. And then I'm getting there. So shrinking. So that's another one. Yeah. Uh, power efficiency. The third one, um, Another law, third law, is uh, Edmund's law. Okay. Comes from, he was the CTO for Nortel. Okay. That predicted way, way back, talking about the technologies with uh, speed, bandwidth of a wireline. So basically, if you have wired connection for e internet, wireless, that's the other one. And the other one, he called it the, um, he called it nomadic. But what nomadic really means in our language is like 3G, cell tower, LTE, 5G type of connections. Okay. They're all kind of also moving exponentially as well, tracking behind the other ones. So at some point, the concept is that right now our LTE connection is just as good or better than uh, dial-up in the 90s. Relative to AR. Yeah. Uh, for, for networking, right? So that uh, applications built in AR and VR they will be very uh, data hungry because there's a lot of, uh, you're pushing pixels, a lot of content. It's not just with mobile apps, there's a lot of uh, kind of more text information. Yeah. Pixels are expensive. So yeah, yeah. at some point, the thing that's exciting right now is um, just to give you some numbers too, is like 4G or LTE right now, your cell, cell connection is about one megabit with what 5G infrastructure is supposed to get you is going to get you to 10 gigabits. It's like 10 times more. I guess... Like 100 times more, sorry. Yeah. Like tens of megabits to 10 gigabit, which is as much as you would get in your wireless at home. So expanding that out, if, you know, if you're thinking about starting a company in a relatively... I mean, like as you described, like AR, VR has kind of been around for 50 years, whatever, but relatively nascent area... What is your advice for like a founder thinking about starting something? Because you went you went through the whole thing, right? Like you did YC, like raised money, you got acquired, like all that, like you know, kind of like more traditional mm -hmm. startup stuff. Um, yeah, how how would you tell a founder to strategize around like even choosing a product to build? And yeah, it depends for the industry. The challenge with spaces with AR and VR is that um, there's a lot of unknowns, right? Okay. And it's hard to be in the space right now when there's so many things that are moving. It's super difficult. I mean, I know kind of in a sense, AR is following on the footsteps of what's happening in VR in the 
maturity cycle a bit. Okay. Where for VR, it was at some point, I mean, the hype with when Oculus got acquired is like hyped yeah. up the whole space. Yeah, yeah. But after that, it's been difficult for sometimes to raise money for that space for content creators. Can be difficult sometimes. Um, I mean, not impossible, but mm-hmm. it's sometimes difficult. For AR, has some a bit of that. Is just people still right now testing the waters. What is like the the killer app for AR that's still early to be determined? I mean, the one that we see right now is the Pokemon Go and Antic. Yeah, like the, yeah. One of the few, maybe only AR games that is significantly profitable. So it's, it's hard. So as a founder, starting right now, well, I, my bet on it would have been talking about this technology trend on economic cycle. It is personally thinking, betting more on the installation phase kind of uh, style of companies, which have to do more with uh, core technology that gets built out. Because a lot of those, there's tons to do. There's so many problems to solve. Uh, before any of that, before 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 going into the applications, right? Right. Those I think have better chance right now. If you ask me about now, mm-hmm. later could swing and change. Uh, but those are some of the companies I see in AR a bit better chances right now. Right. So you can kind of like have conversations with investors around tooling, around developers. Those are the kind of paths you found. Yeah, more interest. Yeah, but it's also a bit challenging because as, as a tooling and infrastructure company, mm-hmm. the investor is going to ask you, okay, do your customers who are developers make money? Right, yeah. Are they just like kids goofing around in their basement? Right. Yeah. It's, just, it's hard to. It's, it's, you kind of have to sometimes find the believers on that. So creating technologies in kind of this emerging tech sometimes is difficult because of this. It's, yeah. Uh, finding. So what, what was that process like? How did you find the right right folks? So, in, in one sense, we we had the good timing that AR Kit just got launched at that time. I mean, yeah. that's another funny story when it got launched. So there was a lot of uh, positive uh, enthusiasm for the space around that. Yeah, that was one. The other one, we were lucky to really get connected with investors that really believe in this future and with us that it would take a long time. So we got um, backed up uh, our lead investor for our seed round was uh, Jeff Clavier from um, Encore Capital, who really was with uh, with us in really believing where all these pieces were coming about and, and really taking that bet on us. Mm-hmm. And besides that, it was also Founders Fund, also seeing that vision with us that, yes, this makes sense. So it's kind of finding those, those kind of people. So were those folks through Demo Day, through intros? How did they find you? Because I think... Where mm. invariably people are asking me, it's like, how do I find the right investor to right. who will support my my vision? So part of it is through the YC, through YC. brand carries a lot of uh, gravitas in a sense. Hopefully. Part of it is um, before Demo Day, we had show one of the first um, AR multiplayer cross-platform at that time, point in time, like two years ago, mm-hmm. that worked. Uh, and that created a, a lot of that kind of, a lot of that buzz that we got contacted. Mm-hmm. And that, that was one of the big things is like really driving the technology to have provable points with emerging tech. You kind of have to show that it's doable and where it's going to give a sense instead of, so it was actually building it yeah. at like a minimum. Showing functional products. A, yeah. a demo. Yeah. Which is a bit different than I, I know other founders friend with um, sometimes that 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 first first thing is really having more uh, actual paying customers or early when when the technology is more straightforward. Yeah, it's more about like nailing down the the market. Uh huh. For us, was kind of nailing down the tech early on. Okay, and then once you showed people, they were like, either I don't think so, not right now. What were the what were the responses like? I think when they saw it. The demo we showed was um, Pong in AR. We took okay. like a classic one, classic yeah. classic game, and showed it how it would, you have a ball of fire bouncing on the ground or the wall, and it would scorch the ground. And that just really connected with people. It's just that kind mm. of thing that people's like, oh, wow. 
So it, it took some time to figure out that exact time. It was a weird, more technologist to come up with that. So that was working with a lot. Um, I guess what, what I'm kind of asking is like, you know, the, the people who didn't say yes, who mm. maybe gave you a no or like, a, you know, maybe if this develops further, which is basically a no. How did the, those conversations play out? Because I'm trying to like put myself in the shoes of someone else who's trying to raise money in one of these like n- newer markets. Yeah, the thing about those is that at times it is it is kind of scary to bet in this space when yeah, there's course. very unknown. And it is finding kind of really those investors that are independent thinkers. Because it's sometimes it's funny is when someone invests, then all the other people follow. Yeah. That's kind of eh. Yeah. Uh, but you keep trying. It's sometimes just connecting those and... I think I'd rather really take someone really on board with the, with the vision to be with you to weather, mm-hmm. weather the future <laughs> to right. do it. That's, um, that's way better. Yeah. But, but, but yeah, I mean, with everything is, I mean, for us, it was, it's, it's a bit of an anomaly how it happened, but we did get some no's, but it's okay. You kind of go and keep trying, right? It worked out. It worked out. Yeah. So related to working out, you are now at Niantic. As a founder, I mean, because you guys weren't around that long before the acquisition app. Yeah, that's uh, another unusual yeah. thing too. <laughs> that was super, I mean, it had to be one of the fastest in YC. Yeah, we were, we were just joking. We were like, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good record to set. Yeah, yeah, for better or worse, for sure. Um, but regardless, it happened. So there are, there are some founders who have been on the podcast before who are now at larger companies that have acquired them. What's your advice to, to a founder who's now at a big company, who's managing people, le- leading team, working on stuff, how do you make the most of it? Because you would just put, you know, you're kind of like your heart and soul into something that you started. And there's, there's a degree of passion in your thing that's really hard to feel for someone else's thing. Hmm. So how do you make it work and, and get satisfaction out of it? It's a very good question. I mean... Part of it for us why Niantic was a good fit is that the vision of what Azure Reality started as, we are still building it. So that's a huge motivator to continue do that, mm-hmm. to do that. Um, that's huge to be able to at least do that. I know it's not a luxury for every acquisition, but to be able to do that and still have uh, some of the freedom and the trust from, um, from the founders at Niantic is great. Mm. The other thing is, um, I guess the way like to tell Niantic is still also a startup, but it's a much larger scale. Mm-hmm. The way sometimes is thinking about it is uh, kind of taking Azure, which was a seed stage, skipping it and going to Series B. <laughs> okay. It's so, like skip fast forward. Yeah, That's yeah. what it felt like. The other thing is to take this opportunity and reframe it a bit. Is still a very valuable space to learn other kinds of skills. So. Now it's kind of more taking in that hyper growth company. I mean, we, when we joined the company, I mean, from last year to this year, it's like at least 5X. It's like crazy. 5X employees. Yeah. Yeah. So that kind of growth and be part of that, that was like so exciting and learning other kinds of skills and reframing those because it is kind of leading in a bigger, bigger scope. Mm-hmm. And that's that's part of it that kind of worked out. And I know it's like a lot of it comes down to relationship with people is having a good report with the leadership, executing and getting all those all those things aligned. And I know sometimes it can be can be difficult because it's different cultures, right? It's kind of like uh, immigration, <laughs> right? Yeah. Immigration. Yeah. Uh, there's there's some mutual respect for things that we can learn from from each other and work together as uh, eventually. There's a path to feel as a single company to feel like now I feel as a Niantic employee, right? Hmm. It's not, and that is when it starts kind of more working out to really feel that, that bought into where Niantic is going. And that I am excited with, with where we're going. Yeah. And at this point it is, it is exciting to see all the things that we've done. I mean, a lot of the um, demos that we showcased last year created the splash with AR where a lot of the work in my team yeah. is great. And other things this year announced in Niantic that are also great. We announced the developer context where we um, allowed 
invited, made it a contest, invited uh, 10 selected, selected, that's a word, selected 10 developers to work on our platform to see what else they could build outside of the Niantic uh, world. So that was like, started with a conversation with one of the leaders at Niantic, one of, uh, with Ed, who was one of the platform, uh, he leads the platform, the other parts of the platform for Niantic. So it was a conversation last year and then it became a thing this year. Yeah. And it's been great to be welcomed by, by people like, like Ed and to work on something bigger together. Right. So I think uh, if we executed this as, as Escher, it would have been at a smaller scale than what Niantic, we were able to do at Niantic. Or a longer time frame. Or a longer or time both. frame. Or both. Yeah. We got the luxury of the rest of the Niantic uh, machine to get this out. Did you find that there were tricky elements culturally in like transitioning the team together? There's always those when you join it. I mean, right? When, when you sure, join, yeah. Those kind of happen. And part of it is um, having, taking time, patience to work through those things and having faith in the long term. It's kind of making it happen. And so th this is funny. You, you mentioned it already, but like uh, it, it's all tied back to also you being an immigrant to the U.S. and that whole experience. So you should explain it because it's actually a super interesting story. Um, <laughs> but to set it up, uh, you immigrated from Chile to the U.S. during high school. But maybe you can provide the backstory. Yeah, perhaps I think as you integrate with different things in your life, it is a series of immigrations <laughs> into different things, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. I think of it that way. Um, so a bit, of, a bit of a summary of a life story. Um, I grew up in Chile. I'm yeah. still a Chilean citizen. And the way I ended up in the U.S. is, or Chile, maybe start with that. My parents were trying to find a better life outside of China because of all the situations that was that was happening back in the 70s. So they applied for a visa and went wherever it took them first. And the first place that they followed was Chile because another family member had been there. So they went there. Mm -hmm. So then I was born and normal life things happen, right? Uh, so I didn't know anything about the US. I knew I had an aunt in there, but apparently, my parents also applied for a family visa lottery to the U.S. before I was born. Mm -hmm. And happenstance, which is really bizarre, that went through uh, when I was around 16, 17. And then uh, my parents said, it's like, um, that it was very difficult to immigrate because you leave all your roots, learn a new language, unknown environment start your scratch your life from scratch from zero you drop in the middle and do that it's like we've done that once already we could do it again but it's really hard um but think of it take this opportunity to do something i know they were seeing that i've been always curious and been good at tinkering with things and math it's like take this opportunity to to do something it's like you might end up doing something interesting I was like, I, I never had to take that chance because otherwise I would regret it forever. And then moved with my aunt for a bit for, and did like um, the last two years of high school in there. And that was boot camp for me. Yeah. So I had to catch up with everything um, because the education in Chile is not great. Just for comparison, you learn kind of algebra like in your senior year. So I did a crunch for a lot of things in a year. And because in a year and caught up to calculus in a year, up to calculus, like that pre-calc, geometry and all that, algebra, crunch it in one year, plus also physics and all these things, except English. English, I've been in ESL. I was still in ESL in <laughs> college. So I had to take ESL when I went to, when I went to college still. Because English was hard. Yeah. Still hard. Um, so... That was kind of the resilient part of really understanding what what I could do, and it was um, it was really challenging. I mean, coming to this new space and being by myself in school, and it was the hardest thing I had to do back then, and also all of that. And because I had to really do something good out of it, and it was hard for my parents too because they 
were earning in pesos and then I was living in dollars. So I really wanted to figure out how to cut college short too. Yeah. So then I managed to also take AP classes in the last year and finish college early and then go to job and take loans and pay all that back. And <laughs> that's kind of the story of uh, immigrating and through those lots of um, lessons uh, through that, it feels almost like a different person. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I was very focused on on that goal. I To really graduate, do something interesting, and ended up doing engineering and computer science because that seemed to be what um, I was kind of good at. <laughs> and so as someone who then works at a big company mm -hmm. and then started a company, what advice would you share for other immigrants to the U.S. around starting a company? And, and even maybe perhaps bigger than that, like just like motivating yourself to leave a big company and go out and do your own thing. Yeah, so with the one about uh, immigrants, I think the thing that's exciting about um, U.S. versus, let's say, Chile and I imagine other countries as well, is a lot of this... Um, positive determinism mentality <laughs> yeah that uh really entrepreneurial where people really want to go at it and because things are in a state of abundance in a sense in the u.s with stability mostly i mean yes there's a lot of not for everyone but yes most yes here at least <laughs> yeah more so than let's say in other countries yeah. it is still very challenging other parts of the u.s poverty lines but yeah. bearing that um the level of abundance when you do get into those environments is something that frees you up psychologically to really f explore. And it's exciting coming as an immigrant because you get more um, like-minded people. I think it's in the U.S. where I found more people that kind of thought like me, hmm. more so than when I was in Chile, uh, to really explore and try things out. And there will be challenges, of course, coming from... Depending as a as an immigrant, what type of company you start, there are some that need more understanding of the cultural norms or laws that you kind of sometimes need to be more have more years in the U.S. to do. But there's certain things that they don't have any barrier on those, and those are great to start. In fact, actually, this is actually very quoted quoted a lot. A lot of the big tech companies have been started by mm -hmm. immigrants, right? It's just there's something about that. Yeah. About about having gone through. Now it's the version of the human installation and deployment, <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think that the just immigrant mentality is wonderful. Um, so right now, you know, it's July. We're in the middle of the YC batch. Uh, you know, in spite of being acquired and working at a, a larger <laughs> company right now. Uh, what would be your advice to people in the in the batch right now to to make the most of it, and and to be honest, like make the most afterwards because I think that's something that I'll often stresses people out. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, angst about what to do with your life, and it's like is YC the pinnacle or or things <laughs> like that. It's, um, but it's a process in your life to keep always recommitting to what you're doing. But the advice is. Um, YC is a great time to really get your, the thing that YC is amazing is really taking that really brittle stage of companies and C to make them pass that because that's kind of the incubation stage where a lot of companies have a lot of difficulties. I mean, we did too. And with YC gives a lot of focus and direction because that, that's part of the things like as a startup, you're limited resources, mm -hmm. limited time, and you're competing sometimes with larger companies that may be going after the same space with a lot more resources. But what are the things that you can do different and like the bigger companies? And it's things with doing activities of high leverage that there was advice from YC that big companies wouldn't do because they don't scale, quote unquote. And as part of that is sometimes just doing things by hand, right? Like sometimes uh, big companies wouldn't just do like a very brittle hacked up demo. Yeah. Things like that. So really taking advantage of that and YC is great for fundraising your seed. <laughs> and getting to know also your batchmates. Mm -hmm. I think you never know. Sometimes a lot of these things are 
it might be the current company you're working in with, but this is like in the future, we're in this space. It's not meant to be um, kind of zero sum or finite. Uh, you will live many lives. It might be this current company. Hopefully it's this one that you're building. That'd be great. <laughs> That'd be great. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't. But there's a lot of uh, awesome people that you can get to know as well. Yeah. It's something I need to do more often, actually. Um, all right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank yeah. you for coming in. Thank you.